if you're going to quit, quit when it's going well. If you're going to quit, quit when it's easy. If you're going to give up, give up at the top of the mountain, not at the bottom of the mountain, not on the side of the mountain, not in the middle of the mountain. Give up when you get to the top of the mountain. If you're going to quit, quit after you make it work in grand fashion. Quit after you build and sell a successful business. Don't quit on the journey. I'm going to share with you why I don't quit when it's working, why I keep working when it's not working for me. Are y'all ready for this? It's... This is so mind-blowing. I'm going to read something to you from um, Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes chapter 10. I, I, I would venture to guess if I were a betting man, and I'm not, but were I a betting man, I would venture to bet that you have probably never heard a sermon on this passage in your life. You've never heard anybody teach on it, probably. I know I've never heard anybody teach on it. Okay. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 starting with verse five. We're gonna read down to verse number nine. Here's what it says. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses, and princes walking as servants upon the earth. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. Whoso breaketh a hedge a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. What? Let's go. Here's here's the problem. People will start working on something because they have this grand vision in their mind, and they think, when this happens, it's going to be great. And it doesn't happen as fast or as smoothly as they thought it should happen, and then they quit. The reason I keep working when things aren't working, and I'm using that tongue-in-cheek aren't working, when they seem to not be working, is because I understand how it really works. The reason, the re- it's, yes, there's, there's danger involved, there's risks involved, but even though there are risks involved, I'm going to work when it looks like it might not work if when it does work, it's worth it. See, if if the downside is limited and the upside is unlimited, that is a chance I'm always willing to take. And see, there are people who are not willing to take a chance on an unlimited upside because they're so afraid, afraid of the limited downside. Now, if something has a limited upside and an unlimited downside, I'm just going to ignore it. It's not even worth looking at. Um, for me, if something has the potential to make me go back to ground zero and start over from scratch, I'm not even gonna look at it. Unless I'm already at ground zero. Then it doesn't matter. See, it's it's interesting. You remember the parable about the talents, right? The master comes to his talent, we're gonna call him an employee. The employee comes to his, 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 his employees. He says, I'm going on a long journey, I need you to manage my money while I'm gone. He gave one five talents. He gave another uh, two to another, he gave one. He went, came back, this is in Matthew chapter 25, for those of you who want to go read it later. He, get, he went away, came back. When he came back, the one he gave five to said, you know, while you were gone, I gave your money to the exchangers, and, um, and I've turned your five into ten. Here, here's your ten. The one that got two said, oh, 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 you remember that talent you gave, the two talents you gave me? Yeah, I took it, I, I put it in the exchange, and I traded it, and when it came back, um, I, I've got four for you. Would like to have done more, but I got this four, these four. The guy that received one came to his boss and said, um, you know, I know you're a hard man and um, you gather where you haven't reaped and you, or you reap where you haven't sown and you gather where you haven't strawed. So I, was, I, I, I made sure I didn't lose it. And because I was afraid, I buried it in the earth. And here, you can have your talent back. He said, wait, 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 time out. You knew I reap where I haven't sown? You knew I gather where I haven't strawn? You should have then taken my money and given it to the exchanger so that when I came back, I might have received mine own with usury. Why? Because God loves multiplication. Now, 
Now, here's what's interesting about that whole story. Who had the most to lose, the guy with five talents or the guy with one? The guy with five. I am telling you, this is one of the most strange phenomenon in the world. Phenomena? Phenomena in the world. Phenomenons, phenomena. <laughs> Don't do it, Myron. Don't do it. <laughs> I, I just started thinking of these little children's cartoons that I used to watch when I was a kid. I'm like, what's going on? Okay, so, so here's what's amazing. The people that have the most to lose are the least afraid to lose it. And the people that have the least to lose are the most afraid to lose it. It's just like that today. Yeah, man, that seems like a scam. Bro, I got some bad news for you. You grown and broke. You already been scammed. You're a full grown adult. And broke. And you worried about somebody scamming you? What they gonna get? And so Solomon said, I've seen an evil on the earth. What's the evil? I've seen... Uh, an evil which I've seen under the sun, and an error that proceeded from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity. There are people who are more successful than you, who are less talented than you. There are people who are more successful than you that are not as smart as you. There are people that are more successful than you who are less skillful than you. The difference is... Uh, servants upon horses, princes walking as servants upon the earth. Why? Well, I believe the next verse tells us, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. The risk associated with preparing to build something scares people away. It says, he that breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Isn't, this is really fast. This whole story is really fascinating to me. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. Whoso breaketh the hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith. And he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. So let's talk about, okay, you're digging a pit. If you fall into the pit, what could happen? Well, you could break your neck. You can break your arm, you can break your leg, depending on how deep the ditch is, right? So it's like, I don't want to dig a ditch that might end up causing me to fall into it and break my neck. And digging a ditch is really an interesting, it's really an interesting analogy to make. So if you read King Solomon, so if you, if you go read 1 Kings chapter 3, you will see that God, that Solomon asked God for an understanding heart to discern judgment. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding greater than all the kings that were before him, greater than all the kings that came after him. And um, the next chapter says that Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs and his songs were 1,005. 3,000 Proverbs. I want you to think about that. So in our modern day vernacular, that would be like Instagram posts, Facebook posts, Twitter posts. Do you have 3,000 Instagram posts, Twitter posts? Right? And you wonder why nobody knows about you. Because the wisdom that you have, you're not putting out it into the marketplace for the world to find. I'm telling you. Okay, so... Our business has done millions and millions of dollars in sales. And guess what? This year, we spent zero dollars on advertising. Why? Because we've written 3,000 Proverbs and our songs are 1,005. Are you tracking? All, I'm doing, all I do is put content out that helps people. I don't have to go look for them. They come looking for me. Do you have any more? Do you have any more? Do you have any more? And anybody can do that. But see... Unfortunately, because we were programmed in a Western society where some previous historical business moguls didn't understand that winning is not a zero-sum game, they built manufacturing plants to make the stuff that they were going to sell to the consumers, and then they built manufacturing plants for the workers to come work in their factories, and they call them schools. Oh, that's, that's a historic fact. That's why the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, all of, they, they contribute so much money to the educational system. 
so they can produce exactly the person they want for the jobs that need to be filled in their factories. That's, that was their original intent. That's not, that's not, oh, I thought that was common knowledge. <laughs> okay, so, okay. And so here's the problem though. Because we've been programmed to have a job, we think that the 11th commandment was thou shalt have a job <laughs> with benefits. <laughs> right? That's what we think. But the reality is, here's, there's nothing wrong with having a job, but it does create, it creates some issues inside of us. We become dependent on someone we don't know to make sure that we and our families are provided for. That's one. But the other problem is we get addicted to a paycheck. And we become so addicted to a paycheck that if it doesn't make us money instantly, we don't want to do it. And so when you're, when you're, when you're doing your, uh, writing your 3,000 Proverbs and your 1,005 songs, um, maybe you don't make any money at all until that 1,005th song comes out, right? And see, we want to sow today and reap today. That's not the law of the farm. The farm don't work like that. We, we got drive-through, we got drive-through restaurants, drive-through banking, drive-through dry cleaners. We got instant microwavable meals, instant this, instant that. Everything's instant drive-through and microwavable. So we want instant drive-through microwavable success. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> this ain't that, y'all. And so the reason... I keep working when it's not working for me is because I know that I'm bigger than it and I know that if I'm not afraid of the risk and I keep on going, like, like when I was broke, you lose everything, that's okay. <laughs> I haven't had anything most of my life, I'll be all right, <laughs> right? And, and, and I did, I mean, for the most part, went from being really, really rich to being really, really poor for a number of years. But the reason I became poor is because I lost perspective. It wasn't because, and I, I didn't become poor. I became broke. I, I, I was, I just, I didn't have any money for a short period of time. <laughs> I was, I was in transition. <laughs> I was in transition. I was transitioning from not having no money to having some money. Okay. So, um, the interesting thing about that is, I, I just lost perspective. I lost perspective of truth, and I started getting, I started getting meaning from circumstance, instead of giving meaning to circumstance. Are you figuring out what I'm putting down? And, and the, word, the whole word circumstance is really fascinating anyway, isn't it? Because the scripture says, <clears throat> a wise man's eyes are in his head. Think about that. A wise man's eyes are in his head. What, what, what can we ascertain from that? Well, we don't see with our eyes. We see with our mind. Our eyes are just one of the tools our mind uses to see. And what's interesting is there are two types of animals on the earth. What are they? Predators and prey. Now, what's interesting is prey, most prey, just basically eats grass and berries and nuts and stuff. And most predators eat other animals, right? Well, what's, here's what's interesting. In order for the prey to stay alive, it has to starve the predator. In order for the predator to stay alive, it has to eat the prey. Here's what that means. Somebody got to go. <laughs> okay. Now, you can tell, when you look at an animal, you can tell by looking at them at a glance whether they're predator or whether they're prey. How can you tell? Where their eyes are located. Where their eyes are located. Predators have their eyes in front of their head so they can see what they're pursuing. Prey have their eyes on the side of their head so they can see what's pursuing them. So if you take your hands, if you take your fingers, everybody take your fingers like this. Take your fingers like this. Even on YouTube, take your fingers like this. I'm watching you. I'm not really watching you on YouTube, but I'm pretending I am. Okay, take your fingers like this. I want you to look at both fingers. Keep, move, keep your eye on both fingers as you move your arms farther apart. So we have, um, that's about it right there. I'm going to say, based on my understanding of geometry, that's about 100, a radius of 172%. It's not quite 180. 180, I can't see either one. 
Okay, I even got to 177%. Okay, 177% radius. Why? Because my eyes are in front of my head. But imagine this. If one eye is on this side and one eye is on this side, I can see halfway around this way and halfway around this way. I can see what's around me. So think about this. The word circumstance comes from the word circle and stand. What is a circumstance? A circumstance is the situation that surrounds me while I'm standing still. So if you're going to change your circumstance, stop standing. It's called a circum run. It ain't called a circum charge. It ain't called a circum march. What's it called? A circumstance. Stop standing. And so the prey has its eyes on the side of its head. The predator has the eyes in front of our head. The wise man's eyes are in his head. So I get to decide every day when I wake up, am I going to be a predator who passionately pursues my purpose? Or am I going to be a prey who's paralyzed by all the circumstances that surround me? And so many people are so paralyzed by looking at all the things that could go wrong if they do this thing that's in them. They were made for it. But if they do it, they ask the most expensive question in world history. But what if it doesn't work? Do you realize that it's hard to get the answer to the question you don't ask? But if you ask, what if this doesn't work? Guess what answer you're going to get? Well, if it doesn't work, uh, uh, I ain't going to make no money, and they're going to come get my car, and I'm going to be living in the dark, and I'm going to get evicted out of my house. And, right? Because you ask the question, what if it doesn't work? So the only answer you can get is the answer to what if it doesn't work. If you learn to ask better questions, you will discover better answers. What's a better question than what if this doesn't work? Here's a good one. How awesome is this going to be when it works? Wow. I wonder what neighborhood I'm going to live in when it works. Hmm. I wonder what kind of car I'm going to drive when it works. Where would I like to go on vacation when this works? Hmm. Would I like to fly, fly private when this works? Are you tracking? So when you ask better questions, you get better answers. And so because, because there are princes walking as servants upon the earth and um, folly is set in great dignity and rich sit in low place, because he that diggeth a pit shall fall, there in, uh, shall fall into it. So those are some of the dangers. Breaketh a hedge and servant shall bite him. Well, what, what's, what's the problem with that? Well, the servant bites you. One thing we know going to happen, if the serpent bites you, serpent bites you it's going to hurt, right? And if it's a venomous serpent, you're going to get sick. And if it's venomous enough, you might die. So because I might fall into the pit, I'm not going to dig it. Because I might get, when I'm clearing this area, because when I'm clearing this area, there might be a snake in there. And I'm going to be honest with you now. Okay, so there. <laughs> that was a good accident. Okay, so, so, so I'm, a, I'm a golfer. In Florida, here's what we have in the woods. Everything. <laughs> Everything. We got alligators in the woods. Not just in the water, they're in the woods too now. I've seen them in the woods. Okay, we got alligators in the woods. We got bobcats in the woods. Wild hogs in the woods. I mean, depending on what part of Florida, panthers in the woods. And least, my least favorite of all, snakes. My chances of seeing a panther in the woods are good. Woods are green. I'm colorblind, but I can tell that black panther ain't green. <laughs> right? My chances of seeing a wild hog in the woods are pretty good. Even an alligator, 
you know, they're really big and lethargic and kind of clumsy-ish on land. I can see it probably before it sees me. But a snake? That joker could be sitting right beside me licking his chops, and I don't even see. So, the concern about serpents, like, I get it. I'd rather be five five feet from an alligator than five feet from a snake. Eight days a week, twice on Sunday. So, like, it's not that the the potential danger is not real. The potential danger is real. He that breaketh the hedge, the serpent shall bite him. He that moveth stones, removeth stones, shall be hurt therewith. You might drop one on your foot, break your foot. You might be putting one up on top of something and drop it on your head and get a concussion. Like, the ch- like when you're working on something, here's what we're learning from this. Work has risk associated with it. If you don't do the work because you're afraid of the risk, you will never get the wealth that only the work can bring. So it's not that we should ignore risks because the scripture says the wise man foreseeth evil and hideth himself, but the foolish pass on and are punished. So we don't want to be stupid about it. What we want to do is we want to measure the risk and then we want to calculate whether the risk is worth the reward. And if the risk is a limited downside and the reward is an unlimited upside, I'm jumping on that train Every time. As long as that train is going in the direction of my purpose. Are y'all tracking? Because, by the way, making money is not, should not be the primary determining factor of whether or not you say yes or no to a business opportunity. Because all good money ain't good. There's, you can make some good money doing some bad things. You can make some good money doing some things that are filled with hassle that are not bad. They're just filled with hassle. I don't like hassle. So you know what I do? I don't do those things. I don't like doing bad things. I'm not going to, I'm not, oh, but this thing can make you so, I I get that. Brother man can't be, I I, I can't do it. So then it says, he that moved the stone. Now here's what, here's the parallel that I saw. When I'm reading this, I'm thinking, this is amazing. This reminds me of the first command, not the first commandment. First command. It says, um, he that removes stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. What's going to happen? Well, you can be cleaving wood, chopping wood with an axe, right? And you can get a splinter in your eye or in your hand. Or the axe head could come off and hit you in the arm or the leg or the foot. There's, there, there are dangers associated with work. That's why it ain't called play. But there's dangers associated with play. We just have to evaluate whether or not the risk is worth it. And see, some of us won't even risk hurt feelings enough to make an offer to somebody to make their life better, which would, and it would be good for them and profitable for us. Because we are so f- internally fragile that if somebody sell, says no, we feel like we've been rejected by our seventh grade boyfriend or girlfriend. Right? Am I, am I telling the truth? It's like, ah, I don't like the way that feels. I didn't have a seventh grade girlfriend. I like girls, but I didn't think they liked me, so I just left them alone. <laughs> like, this is, this is too much hassle. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> it's really interesting that the first command, the first... Wow, why does that keep happening? The first thing that God ever said to man, the first thing God ever said to man was, like, this is the first conversation that God had with a human. Be fruitful. Do multiply. Do replenish the earth. And subdue it. And then have dominion. Now, here's what he said. Be, do, 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 have. That's the formula. The first success formula in world history, be, do, have. Here's what it means. Don't be, can't do, can't do, can't have. Be a little, do a little. Do a little, have a little. Be a lot, do a lot. Do a lot, have a lot. Are y'all tracking? Now, you say, what does this have to do with this? Well, when I'm reading this, I'm thinking about what do you dig holes for? Dig holes for preparation. 
Maybe you're going to build a building, you dig a hole to pour a foundation in. Maybe you're going to plant some seed, you dig a hole to put the seed in. Maybe you're going to plant a tree, you dig a hole to put the tree in. You, you, you track it? So when you're dig, like digging a hole is preparation. You're preparing for something. And so because for a lot of people, they won't prepare for their assignment because of the time cost associated with it, the money cost associated with it, or the stigma cost associated with it. And so they don't prepare. And so when their time comes, they're not ready. In, in fact, I think it's, um, it's, in the, it's in chapter 9. Here's what it says in chapter 9. <laughs> it says in Ecclesiastes 9.10, it says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. In other words, whatever you're going to do, put everything you got into it. And if it's not worth putting everything you got into, it's probably not worth doing it at all. Does that make sense? Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Um... Let me see, where was I? Yeah, whatsoever thou do with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Hmm. Watch what happens next. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift. So you're not going to win the race just because you're the fastest. That doesn't guarantee you a win. The race is not to the swift, um, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet... Bre in other words, just because you're the strongest in the fight don't mean you won't win the fight. Neither yet... Bread to the wise, you're not going to eat the best just because you're the most wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding. You're not going to be the richest just because you understand the most. Nor yet favor to men of skill. You're not going to find favor just because you're the most skillful. What does it say, though? It says, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Time and chance is not talking about luck. Time and chance is the intersection between preparation and opportunity. So who is the person that wins the race? The one that's most prepared when the race starts. Who is the person that wins the battle? The one that's most prepared when the battle starts. Who is the one that has favor and bread and riches? The one who's most prepared. And if you dig a hole while you're preparing yourself, here's, here's what's going to happen. It's going to take time. Preparing yourself is going to take time. And some people, because of the risk associated with the time that it takes to prepare, that because that time that I'm preparing, I'm not doing other things that I'd really rather do. Can I get a witness? So I'm not preparing for the rest of my life because I'm existing through this current chapter in my life. And so, I don't prepare. He that... Um, uh, I think it said cutteth a hedge Let me, I, I want to read it to you because I don't want to be making stuff up I mean I'm good at making stuff up but I don't want to make stuff up when it comes to the Bible okay so um, he, that digeth, he that breaketh the hedge um, a servant shall bite him huh so oh I, I forgot to tell you be fruitful and multiply let me go back there first be fruitful what is fruitful a fruit, according to Genesis, is a living organism whose seed is in itself. So the ability to regenerate and replicate and duplicate and multiply is inside of you. So when God told man to be fruitful, God is telling us that he put an aspect of his creativity, the seed of an aspect of his creativity inside of all of us. But it's a different, it's a different seed. God gave some people the seed of singing like an angel. And some people he gave the seed of building like an architect. And some people he gave the ability to communicate like, like an orator. And to some people he gave the ability to write like a Pulitzer Prize winning author. He didn't give all of us, he didn't give any of us everything, but he gave all of us something. But what we have to do is we have to cultivate the seed of the aspect of creativity that God put inside of us. We have to cultivate that seed and let it produce. So that, that's the B part. Being fruitful means you make sure what I put inside of you shows up outside of you. That's what be fruitful means. Multiply, what's that mean? Increase. So you're going to increase. What's that mean? Well, when you start increase, it's going to take up what? It's going to take up space. Right? If you're going to be fruitful, you've got to plant a seed in the ground. Right? If you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to increase, it, you're going to need space. 
And so you have to clear out all of this rubbish. You have to clear out these bushes. You have to clear out these hedges. Oh, a snake might bite you. Clear it out anyway. Make room. Like you prepare yourself and then you make room for the blessing regardless of the risk associated with making room. Are you tracking? And then it says, he that moveth stones shall be hurt therewith. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Replenish means to fill up the earth. So after I clear out this space, now I need to fill up the earth. What is moving stones? Why am I moving stones? Because stones are what we build things with. And so there's risk associated with the preparation. There's risk associated with the clearing there's, and making of room. There's risk associated with building something. But do it anyway. It's not going to be easy. It's just going to be worth it. It's not going to be cheap. It's just going to be worth it. Everybody's not going to go with you, but it's still going to be worth it. Are y'all tracking? This is why I keep on working when stuff seems like it's not working for me. And, and I say it seems like it's not working for you because everything is working. It's either working on me or it's working for me. And so many people don't like the way it feels when the work is working on you, so you stop working on it. And so because you stop working on it, it can't work for you. But if you let it work on you long enough, you will become the person for whom it can work. But between the time you dig the hole and plant the seed and clear the space and move the stone and start building, between all of that time, there's a gestation period. Don't become impatient with a just, I sowed the seed yesterday, where's my fruit? It's not how it works. So then it says, he that... Um, Cutteth, uh, um, cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. Well, what is that talking about? Cleaveth wood. That's like, that's what we do when we cut down trees, right? We're cleaving wood, right? We're chopping wood. Well, what's the last thing the scripture told us to do? Be fruitful, dig the hole, right? Multiply. You need to clear out some space for all the stuff you're about to have. Increase. You start to build. And then um, replenish the earth. Okay. That's replenish the earth. You're filling it. That means to fill it up. You're building stuff. And then it says, subdue it. Subdue? What does subdue mean? Trample down. Because disruption always follows intention. So when you start to dig your hole, you're going to face some opposition. And when you start to clear out the, rub, the shrubs, you're going, to, you're going to face some opposition when you start to make room. And when you start to build something, you're going to face some opposition. So in case you're confused, because a lot of people are, a lot of people think that when it doesn't work instantly, that's a sign they're going in the wrong direction. But oftentimes, that's a sign you're going in the right direction. You start working out, you don't feel stronger first. You feel in pain and weaker first. You start eating right. You don't feel better first. You have a healing crisis. And you start, you start feeling worse first. More worse comes before more, comes before more better. How many of y'all tracking? And see, we want the more better, but we don't want the more worse that comes before the more better. And here's what God said. He said, he said, subdue the earth. If he's telling me to subdue it, if he's telling me to trample it down, that means two things. Number one, I am above it. Number two, I'm more powerful than it, whatever it is. That's why I don't worry about obstacles, because I can subdue them. And when I'm subduing them, I'm using my ax to chop down the tree there's a danger associated with that. And so because there's a danger associated with that, there are a lot of people who should be further in their life. They're not further because all of the risks associated with preparing and making room and building and subduing and cleaving wood and chopping stuff down and overcoming obstacles is too much for them to process. So they seek something they can't find called security. In the words of Helen Keller. Security does not exist in all of nature, neither do the sons of men as a whole experience it. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. Benjamin Franklin said, if we seek security, we have no independence. Robert G. Allen said, there are two doors in life. One is marked freedom, the other is marked security. If you choose the door marked security, you get neither. If you choose the door marked freedom, you get both. 
If you go through life hyper-avoiding every risk, you are also hyper-avoiding every reward. Here's what's interesting. While I'm digging holes and preparing, while I'm clearing out hedges and making room, while I'm moving stones and building, while I'm cleaving wood and clearing, while I'm doing all of that stuff, I am becoming the person for whom it can work. I don't believe that hard work is the formula for success. I believe that hard work is one of the formulas for becoming a better person. Yes. I don't work hard for money. I work hard because if it's worth putting anything into, it's worth putting everything into. How do I know that? Because it says it in the Bible. Whatsoever thy hand finds, do, do it with thy might. I'm not working hard for the money. I'm working hard so that I can, pro everything I do, I want it to show up as excellence. I'm telling you, if you will trust the process, the if-then-go-to statements, the conditional promises, and you do the conditions and let God take care of the promises, you're going to be blown away. By the way, blown away is not the only thing you're going to be. Before you're blown away, you're going to be misunderstood. And you're not just going to be misunderstood by people who don't know you and don't like you. You're going to be misunderstood by people who love you People who are family members, maybe a spouse, maybe a child, maybe a parent, maybe your best friend's going to misunderstand you, but you're going to be misunderstood. Do not think for a half of a millisecond that Christ, who was perfect in every way, shape, and form, he doeth all things well. Such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. This he did once when he offered up himself. If he's all that and he's misunderstood, why are you tripping? Don't be surprised when people don't understand you. Be surprised when they do. telling you, some of y'all are really, really close, but it doesn't feel like it. You're really, really close. I'm talking about to a breakthrough that will create so much momentum for you, when you're working, you'll feel like you're playing. You're so close, but it doesn't feel like you're close. Don't allow the enemy to deceive you in believing that the risk is not worth the reward. Honest, God is, my, God is my witness. Back in 2014, when I was sitting on my patio crying on my wife's shoulder because I didn't know if I wanted to be an entrepreneur anymore. Can you imagine that? Me not knowing if I want to be an entrepreneur. I wasn't sure. I was like, I can't, baby, it's, I'm work, nothing I'm working on is working. Except it was more of an ugly. <laughs> right? It was that kind of. But it was working. It was just working on me. It was making me a better version of myself than I was heretofore, than I had been heretofore, actually. And so it was making me a better version of myself. But I had to stay in the game. I had to stay on the journey. I couldn't afford to put the shovel down just because I might fall in the ditch. I couldn't afford not to move the... Um, hedges, break the hedges just because a snake might bite me. I couldn't afford not to build the thing just because the stone might fall on me. I couldn't afford not to, not to trample down everything that tries to stop me just because I'm going be, to be endangered thereby. I can't walk away from the purpose of my life because the risk of it feels too great. Because here's what I don't want to be. When the Lord comes back and calls me to him as his servant, I don't want to say, I want to say, that five talents you gave me, that two talents you gave me, I turned it into two more. I turned it into five more. Here's what I don't want to say. Because I knew you were a hard man, and you gather where you haven't strawed, you reap where you haven't sown, I, I buried your talent in the earth. And here you can have what's yours. I don't want to say that. 
because I don't want to hear you wicked and unprofitable servant. You knew. But even though you knew, you didn't do what you were supposed to do, even though you knew. I don't want to be that guy. So, every time you read this from now on, you'll see it different. How many of y'all, honestly, you never heard anybody talk, teach you on this passage before, have you? Have you? No. No. I'm like, this is so good. I'm like, this is so good. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error that proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is in great dignity. Is in great dignity. Why? Because they were foolish enough to take a chance on something that shouldn't have worked for them. It should work for you, but they did it. And the rich sit in low place. Do you realize how rich in natural resourcefulness you are in natural resourcefulness deposits? You say, we're running out of natural resources. No, we're running out of people who are resourceful. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Why? Because he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. I'm telling you, you're close. You, you, look, you, you listen to me on YouTube? You see, you looking at my guy giving eyeballs? You're close. You're real close. I'm so glad that in 2014 I didn't quit. Maybe something I've said has helped somebody in this room. It wouldn't have happened if I would have quit. Maybe that's something I've said to help somebody out there on the interwebs. It wouldn't happen if I had quit. And the people that you've been sent to serve in the future, if you stop working, passionately pursuing your purpose, when they get to that place in their life where you were supposed to impact them and you're not there, you fumbled on the five-yard line. Don't give up. I almost gave up. This is, coming, this is not coming from somebody who's never been through anything. I almost gave up. I was like, I don't know, man. This is, I'm, I'm tired. I was, I was young and had a lot of energy when I got started on this thing. I'm tripping now. I'm, I'm, I'm young still-ish. 62 years young-ish, right? But I was tired. I had already built something up, and it was going great. And because I mismanaged it, keeping it real, I'm going to take full responsibility. I mean, yeah, we had some circumstances. We had some situations happen. But if I had acted like circumstances happen, situations come up, then I would have been ready, and I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared when time and chance came. I wasn't ready. Abraham Lincoln said, I will prepare myself, and perhaps my time will come. Myron Golden says, your time is going to come whether you prepare yourself or not. If you're prepared when your time comes, it will reveal you. If you're not prepared, it will expose you. Don't quit. Make sure that your life turns into a reveal, not an expose. I hope this blesses you, like in a really, really big way, but I'm telling you one more time, don't quit. You're almost there. And even if you're not almost there, you're closer than you were last year, and you're closer than you were yesterday. Stay on the journey. Take the risk that's worth the reward, but make sure you count the cost. Stay blessed by the best, my people. Peace out, Cub Scouts. <laughs>